welcome to this session, What is Identity? It's sponsored by the online journal Spiked. <coughs> what we're going to do, we've got an hour, so I'm just going to briefly introduce our, our speakers in the order that they're going to speak. Starting first is my, on my right is Dr. Christine Louis de Silly. She's a writer, former research biologist, and with an interest, a lifelong interest in social and political issues. And on my far left, um, Dr. Graham Archer, who's a writer and professional statistician. He's the winner of the 2011 Orwell Prize for blogging. And finally, Ella Whelan, assistant editor at Spiked, who I said uh, are our sponsors. And she's also uh, the author of a new book, What Women Want, Fun, Freedom, and an End to Feminism. I'm going to ask the speakers to speak for about four or five minutes or, or less if they like. I might ask them a couple of questions, see how it goes, and then get out to you and, you know, have a good, lively conversation. Let's kick us off, Christine. Okay. Black woman coming from an uneducated working class background. So these are some of the identities today that are supposed to define me, that are supposed to give me a particular perspective in life. This identity today are supposed to give you knowledge about my ideas, belief, opinions, before you ever meet me or listen to me today. This identity are supposed to tell you you and me, who my enemies are, and who share common interests with me. All are accidents of birth. Do they tell you who I am? I don't think so. But many today, with the belief that this identity reveals who I am, will revert to insult and abdominum attacks when they found out, through my own action, that these identities do not tell you about my belief and my ideas. And I have to say, my personal experience is that today I have more abuse from people who expect me to say a particular point of view than from racists themselves. In fact, by focusing on these particular identities in our current political discussion, what we do is deny the most important aspect of who we are, our capacity to be moral autonomous agents, to deny the fact that we are capable of free thinking, able to make conscious and rational choices and decisions, able to develop and express our own political and moral views and able to act upon them. By focusing on this identity, black woman from working class, we are also abandoning any possibility for us to reach others, to go and go beyond our current divisions. When we focus on identity during our political discussion, we do not try to debate the kind of society we want to all live, but how different identities, now seen as permanently divided, can struggle and live um, a parallel lives. Identity is about accepting, accepting the way things are instead of finding solutions to our current social problems and to move forward. Do I really need to identify as a black woman to try to convince others and you the importance of free speech? Should my identity as a black woman be more important than the rational arguments that I use? Yes, there are differences uh, between all of us, but discussing the merits of ideas and arguments regardless of who we are, is the only way for us to communicate and understand each other across identities and culture. But more importantly, despite our differences in culture and identity, we are all capable of hearing an idea, understanding it, disagreeing with it, developing it, and promoting it. So I'm not saying that these particular identities are not part of who I am. What I'm arguing is that when we focus on them in our political discussions, when we view ideas and the world and others only through the prism of these identities, innate characteristics become more important than our ability to reach others through reason. The focus on identities that are accident of birth, biology, psychology, ancestry, culture, is leading us away from the idea that we are conscious and rational and active individual. And so it is denying our ability to transcend our given attributes in order to reach others, to understand others, to communicate with others and de to debate and determine our common goals and common interests. Those common goals and common interests are not given. We have to be able to discuss them. If we cannot communicate and understand each other because all ideas are currently thought to be determined by our, our ideas, if we cannot transcend these ideas through the exercise of reason, if we cannot think beyond particular interests determined or not by our identities, then we have no possibility to act collectively and in solidarity with others. 
The only solidarity today, and I think this is not really solidarity, available to us today is determined by our particular identity. So as black, I'm supposed to be in solidarity with black people. Instead of a conscious decision to fight with others for a common, common political cause. So for example, as a black person, I'm supposed to see other black people as having common interests with me, just because they happen to have the same identity. My particular personal experience of racism is supposed to lead me to think that another black person with their own particular experience of racism has more in common with me than the white person who knows and lives with me. The rational debate that would, that would lead us to determine which common values we want to support and which common interest we will have is abandoned and is replaced by interest determined outside our control. And that's what, for me, is really bad. The, the focus on these particular identities is a refusal to take ideas seriously. It is a refusal to develop ideas and argument to convince others through the appeal of reason. If, we, if you want to create a better society, unless you're one of those people happy to impose your opinions on others, I mean, in that case, there's not much I can say, you need to convince others that your ideas are right, that they are good. When you try to convince someone by arguing that history and tradition makes the idea right, all you're doing is you're actually saying to the person that they, are, do, not they do not have to think for the ideas themselves because others in the past already did. When you try to convince someone by arguing that a particular idea, identity determines the truth, like the idea that black people understand racism better than white people, you're effectively saying that your identity makes the thinking for you and that only pe people with the same identity will be, will be capable of understanding it. If only a particular identity group can understand an idea, then what we are asking the others is to do, to do is to accept what you are saying without the possibility for them to criticize and discuss. In a politi political conversation, if we focus on ideas, not on who we are, we use our universal capacity for reason to reach each other. If we see others as conscious, rational agents, capable of making their own decisions and not just as rep representative of a determined identity, we open up the possibility for us to seriously discuss, debate, argue the kind of society we will want to live. Political conversation will always involve divisions, otherwise it becomes meaningless. Because we use different, uh, are they, are they call it? <laughs> the French coming there, yeah? Because, <laughs> because we use different ideological, mm -hmm, I manage, frameworks to, un to understand the world around us. But these frameworks that we use, different frameworks that we use, it can be discussed and debated when we consider ideas and belief. But if we use personal identities, which are seen today as permanent barriers between people, we cannot discuss, and it always leads to conflicts. So we need, uh, we need to debate rationally and what could be our common values and interests and go beyond our particular in identities and interests. Interest. I mean, the reason why I did this uh, thing is because for me, I feel, I've been involved in politics for a long time, but I feel more restricted today than I used to be in the past. The past, racism was a barrier. Today, it's identity. People see me more as a black person than somebody with my own opinions and ideas. I have received more abuse from the fact that I am a black person with my own opinion than by racist. And I think that if we, if we look at each other that way, we cannot, we cannot reach each other because the divisions is always there. And that's why I'm against identity politics. Okay, great. That's, that's a great start to kick us off. Yeah. Okay. Great. Hopefully, we can unpick some of that in a, in a moment, and there's a lot to think about there. Thanks for t kicking us off. Yeah. Graham, do you want to tell us what you think? Follow that. Uh, I'm, that was brilliant, uh, Christina. A lot of that resonated with me, so I think you'll hear. I wanted to start, though, by saying I'm terrible at hiding my body language, and I'm sure it's evident without me saying I am so frightened. I was so frightened to come and accept the invitation to sit here and talk about identity politics, and I, I was thinking about that fear. And I think it actually means something, doesn't it? That we've actually got to the stage where I don't mind at all talking about economics or how to vote in elections or Brexit or anything, or my sexuality or anything, but I'm terrified about expressing my opinion in public about what I think about identity politics because the big, as Christine was saying, the, the, the backlash against saying the wrong thing can be so 
so immense. So the thing about not to like about identity politics is that, but also that it's impossible. Uh, impossible things don't make good bases for politics, I find. And, and also its prescriptive nature. Please take the boxes which apply to you, say the foreign. So I am Scottish, vegetarian, homosexual, male, middle-aged, white, prone to nostalgia, a lover of <laughs> Bell and Sebastian, lower middle class, etc., etc., ad infinitum, etc. An individual identity, I think is obvious, is the union of so many sub-identities as to be all intents and purposes infinite. And what's more, those sub-identities can be contradictory. They don't need to cohere in the mathematical sense. You can be pro-Brexit, but anti-Scottish independence, for example. So what's the phrase um, that I'm thinking of? I had to Google it, but I remember the Walt Whitman poem, Do I contradict myself? He asks in the song itself. Very well, then, I contradict myself. I am large, I contain multitudes. But we, the cultural we, ignore the self-evident multitudinous nature of human personality and instead design an identity politics which maps everyone onto a finite handful of characteristics. So every Briton is an intersection of ethnic heritage slash gender slash orientation slash class slash age slash university education status these days increasingly. And if this is the basis of our politics, politics is to choose, then some of these artificially limiting identities must be worth more than others. So beware the baleful impact of the identity politics calculus. To be blunt, politicians will favour the identity group with the most votes or the loudest lobby groups. It also can lead to political blindness. I don't doubt the good intentions of Mrs May's race audit. I mean, you know, it's a good idea, but I'm not optimistic that its findings will be used positively. In education, for example, to rank outcomes on the basis of ethnic heritage alone is useless, particularly if actual um, heritage are mixed together into an invented identity, B-A-M-E. No human being alive is B-A-M-E. And to compare educational outcomes for B-A-M-E versus non-B-A-M-E is at best misleading and at worst unhelpful. But it's easier, isn't it, to use frequency tables of B-M-E against non-B-M-E A-level results and then suggest a theory about racism than it is to ask questions about why some minority ethnic cultures thrive at school while others do not, or indeed why white working class males have such poor outcomes. If no one is B-A-M-E, then neither is anyone L-G-B-T-Q+. Um, <laughs> this was a bit I'm frightened about, by the way. <laughs> I have nothing against any of the initials, and I'm not joking about that. But I dislike intensely the assumption that because I'm gay, my entire politics is mapped out for me, specifically with regard to the current discussions about transgender issues. I have thought about this a lot. So if what I'm about to say sounds glib or facile, it's not intended to. I've thought about this a lot. I think everyone alive deserves to be treated with dignity, but I honestly can't see how same-sex desire is the same thing as transgenderism. To be romantic, part of my sexuality is a deep attraction to my gender. It's a celebration of masculinity or maleness. That's not the same thing at all as wishing to possess a different gender or none at all. So why are we in an LGBTQ plus box? Being told how to think on the basis of one's love life, whatever else it is, is not liberation. Achieving liberation remains the single most important act for gay people. And being told, telling gay people how they think about stuff because of their same-sex desire is not liberation. At its end point, it leads to the obscenity. Uh, Christine, this was the part of your point, uh, your speech that resonated with me. The obscenity of straight activists turning up at pride marches to jeer at gay Tories. In what perverted mirror do such people see themselves as my champion? I didn't kick my way out of one closet to have ideologues force me into another, even if they've written every letter of the alphabet on its door. Back to Whitman. You shall not look through my eyes either, nor take things from me. You shall listen to all sides and filter them from yourself. Not for yourself, but from yourself. Identity politics feels like an attempt to tell me what my eyes may see to take my messy, incoherent, infinite self and squeeze it into a predetermined closet. I am sick of the feeling that everything not me is unknowable, is forbidden to be known thanks to rules about identity and cultural appropriation. Everything not me slipping further and further away like boxes bobbing around in a sea of despair. Only disconnect uh, would be Foster's summation, I fear. And in fact, if not an intent, identity politics by forcing us into these closets means thinking inside the box and throwing away the key. Thank you.
Thank you, that's very useful. Hello? Glad to see you. Oh, that's tough to follow. Right. <laughs> I was thinking about our current obsession with identity, and it's really easy to track it. There is, I mean, it's, it's, it's an obsession that's been happening for decades, but uh, right now it has really sharp points. So I was thinking about that show, uh, is it called Who Do You Think You Are? Um, where, you know, someone comes on and they find out that hundreds of years ago their ancestor was a bread maker and they think, oh, you know, this changes what I think about myself uh, completely. And so, and so there's a really interesting thing about the desire, which I think is a very human desire to try and pinpoint who, who you think you are and pinpoint what you think your identity is and define yourself. And the thing is, in the past, that was... Um, always described as that, you know, your potential was endless. So you could be a different person tomorrow than you were today, not in the kind of shallow sense of, uh, you know, what so, some of what Graham was talking about in terms of the trans politics and, and you know, completely shifting your gender, but, but thinking a different thing, being a different person, defining yourself with different ideas um, on a different day you were, you know, now the question is who's the real you? You know, who, what is your identity? What's at the core of you? When before it was... You know, had more sense of you can be anything. You can you can uh, transcend your identity and become someone completely, as Christine was saying, completely move away from what the attributes you were given at birth or what you look like or who you you know what is considered to be the right way for you to think. And I was thinking about this. In most prevalent, I think this is in a discussion about um, women and uh, what it is to be a woman. And I was just really struck by it because I'd never thought about uh, what it was to be a woman. In my uh, teenage years, I, you know, it wasn't something that gripped me. I did, wasn't kind of considering it all the time. Um, and I don't think it is something that most women sort of deeply think about. But then in 2015, um, Caitlyn Jenner, who is the transgender celebrity, um, you may know used to be Bruce Jenner, won the 2015 Glamour Women of the Year Awards. She was crowned Woman of the Year. And that may seem like a small point, but I just kind of thought, wow, what does it... I mean, I know it was the Glamour Awards, but what does it take to become Woman of the Year? What does it... You know, if this person who has, by all intents and purposes, merely changed their appearance at this point, because it was very soon after his transition, what is that saying? That is actually saying quite an interesting and big statement about what it is to be a woman, if all it takes, potentially, is to look like one and dress like one and, and, you know, potentially talk like one. But actually, I think that there was something deeper in that. Um, because the reason that Caitlyn Jenner, not to get too hung up on her, is, one, it was because of her bravery. So, you know, the, the whole public conversation about her and about transgenderism was about how brave she was that she'd done this. Um, and she hadn't done anything, really, other than the fact that she had displayed... Um, the ability to get over her vulnerability that she had displayed, you know, poured out her personal life, poured out her identity into the public realm, and that was the thing that was going to be applauded. So the thing that made her woman was, um, in some ways, her ability to show her vulnerability, to embrace her feminine side. We've got a very interesting conversation at the moment about femininity and, you know, what, what that aspect of um, women's life should, should be about. And so then obviously that you can't not link that to the fact that contemporary feminism today more and more defines women and defines a female identity with vulnerability, with victimhood. So, for example, the Me Too craze that's going on at the moment is a complete celebration of victimhood, of vulnerability, of fragile women being able to, you know, finally in the public realm talk about their deeply personal um, experiences. So, uh, you know, identity in that sense is nothing really to do with um, what you think the active decisions you make in society and the active contributions you you give into the public sphere. But it's very much about your failings, your your inability to stand up to difficult situations, your your vulnerability, your childlikeness, especially in relation to women. And so, it just strikes me that. Um, it's kind of a point that my fellow panelists have made and, um, you know, Spike talks about a lot, is that identity now is, you know, it's about personal identity. And there was that, that line, the personal is political, which is from years and years ago. And that is celebrated today. So the thing that makes you interesting is your person, your, not your personality, but your personal aspects of you, which are important. So it is important that I am a woman to me sometimes. 
Other times it isn't. Sometimes it's important that I'm second generation Irish. Sometimes it's important that I'm a Londoner. But so that's a very human thing. But what is most important in relation to when we're talking about identity, um, not just cultural identity, political identity, what matters in relation to how I judge you and if I am to judge your identity, it's your political and social identity, which is about what you think, which has nothing to do with how you look or where you came from. Um, and that may sound like a very utopian idea, but I think it's something that we've sorely forgotten today, that it doesn't matter where you are from um, or what you look like. What matters is what you say. And, I mean, that's a hugely controversial point to make at the moment, as Christine said. Um, you get, at, you know, I wrote the book criticising feminism, and I'm most of the time um, called a misogynist by other women. So there's something very fascinating going on. I think it's our fetishization of the personal over the kind of celebration and more interesting looking at um, the, the political, your interaction with social life. Great. Thank you. <laughs> I should have said our three speakers are all coming at identity okay. politics from a critical perspective. Can we just do a quick experiment? Can I have a, a show of hands of people who think that identity is important to who, who they are. Right, so there's plenty to... There's plenty of disagreement, I think. Um, Chris, just for a throw it out to the audience, Chris, I just want to ask a couple, throw a couple of questions out and feel free to answer them. Why do you think it is um, so seductive at the moment, for, especially for young people? I mean, the things that Ella was saying at the end that resonated with me about who do you think you are, I mean, I've just discovered I've got all this Irish family that I never knew I had and I'm going to meet next week. And I know I find identity a little bit seductive, but have the same kind of reservations as, as, as some of you, but, but um, find myself almost like there's a real distance between me and arg arguing about identity with a lot of uh, younger people. Is it a generational thing, do you think? Uh, no, but um, I, uh, I hope I didn't say that identity is not important. I said that identity is not... Uh, we shouldn't focus on identity in our political discussion. That's what I'm saying. I mean, who I am, I'm a black woman. I grew up in France, you know, working class parents. You know, those, those things are part of who I am. But I think when we want to... Uh, for me, a political discussion is about trying to uh, decide what we want to, how we want to live, what kind of society we want to have. And when we determine ourselves in identity, basically you are saying that the social division that do exist, I mean, there is a difference in society between a black person and a white person. We don't have, I mean, at least especially in the past, we didn't have the same kind of life. But um, when we concentrate on the social division like identity does, basically you are uh, making those divisions kind of permanent as a fact of life which I don't think. I think that this is something that we need to transcend, and we need to transcend it by discussing with each other. I think that um, it's becoming uh, quite an important uh, issue today. I think it's been, like um, Ella was saying, it's been developing for quite a while, and I think it comes from this idea that, for me, it's a bit like giving up on a challenge in society. So we have given up on making a society completely different, and we accepted some things like division between people, and then we're trying to accommodate. One of the things I found in the uh, Battle of Ideas when I hear people um, this weekend so far is there is always this assumption that we are living in a world which, are, which is limited. Uh, for example, in the, income, the universal income um, uh, discussions, it was always about, you know, we, we have a certain limit, limited world, limited resources, and we need to be able to find out how we're going to live to each other. And identity for me is that. It's that we're living in a limited world, and this is how our imagine, imagination today is so, so small that we are living in this limited world, and we need to find how to live. And identity is saying we are different category of people, and we need to be able to kind of category of people need to live together. So it's a bit like, for me, what we're doing is becoming um, groups of people living in parallel life. You know, your black people will fight for uh, uh, something, the white people will fight for something else, the gay people, and it's all because we have this very small imagination of what the world could be in. And I think the, the young people live in a world that people have given up fighting for. Okay, Graham. So. Graham, you got any thoughts on that? And why, why now? Why are you starting to really feel the heat of identity politics breathing down your neck more than in the past? Because it has been around quite a, a suppose, while, hasn't it? I suppose this is way beyond my intellectual pay grade, but there's been this fragmentation of stuff that, that if you're 
I don't know, the, the, I, if I had to guess, I'd guess most of the audience is on the left, all right? But I am what's called a bog-standard conservative. I'm not a deep political thinker. And I guess what's happened is that the values that inform a lot of my identity, the ones that up until the turn of the century middle-class Tories took for granted they were shared by everyone, these have all been fragmented now and everything's up in the air. So, you know, simple things like I grew up with, accepting that I'm a British unionist, there is this nation of Britain made up of its constituent parts. Nothing to argue about there. Everyone took that for granted. That's all, be, that's all gone. So there's been this space where other um, identities can come in. But I brought up the left-right thing, so sorry about that. No, but this is part, no, of, part of our identity. Anyway. One question I have for friends on the left, though, is, is what happened to class? I think the, 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 you know, the, the, the left analysis, which I've never been able to come up with a, a put down for, is how um, class drives outcomes in our country. And um, I, I've actually accepted that. I think the left are right about that. And this, if you've got two theories for something like educational outcomes, one is racism or, or ethnic heritage drives differentiated um, eth uh, educational outcomes. And the other theory is that class drives or is a predictor of differential educational outcomes. It seems to me that second theory is at least as a priori interesting, and yet we seem to put all our energy into these more modern identity buckets, assuming, oh, it must be something to do with ethnic heritage that's causing these differential outcomes. I just, so a question for actually for when people are asking us, what's happened to class in our discussion? Why is that identity now almost obliterated? Ella, I just wanted to say I really agree with you on this point that we've got to tackle this idea that females are universally vulnerable. Because the flip side of that myth is, of course, a call for some sort of paternalistic measures to protect women from men. And so then we go back to Christina's point about how this sort of naturalizes male predatory sexuality. And that doesn't treat men as though they are rational agents. Um, and therefore responsible for whatever behavior they may choose to undertake, whether it be predatory or whatever. Okay. So we have to treat them as individuals so that we can hold them to account. Otherwise, we will start using paternalistic, authoritarian um, kinds of segregation to protect women. And that's not progressive. Great, thank you. Hi. Uh, Steve Watson, Graham, interestingly raised about class. There's a reason for this. And also, it's very interesting that Christine's here because she's from France, which is the home of postmodernism. I'll come to it in a the reason why class doesn't feature in this, the history, which the left always refused to discuss, go back to the late 20s, Central European intellectuals couldn't understand why, uh, despite Marx's prescription prediction, there'd be no rising in the West, but there was in a more backward area of place of, of Russia. All right? So they got together, what's causing this? Ah, using a, a bogus idea from Freud. The workers are repressed by capitalism. And, in, and the, head, the male head of the household in turn represses his wife. This is the roots of third wave feminism, right? They went to America to Columbia University because of Hitler. This, and this is when ideas of postmodernism molded with this. So it's interesting to know how far identity policy is, is penetrated in okay, France. Keep it brief. Yeah. The one up then is, is the new left in the 60s, in 68, 69. Oh, these look like Marxist revolutions, civil rights and Stonewall. And then after 1970, you got this idea there were three classes of, of people uh, who were victimised, women, ethnics, uh, and, and non-heterosexuals. And that's what the shit... It's all about shitting on ordinary people. It's got nothing whatsoever to do with being nice to people, right? Okay. And so it'll be interested to hear from Christine how much this Actually, shit well. takes hold in, in France. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, I just wanted Hi. to say... Thank you to Christine for a great speech. I think you were very well understood what you talked about, about how politics used to be organized by values, how we would get behind the values and the ideas that we believed in. But these days we look inwards, we think about our sexuality, race, gender, and we think, well, who best represents, represents me? Who identifies with this? Who acknowledges my gender fluidity, et cetera, et cetera. In terms of the question about what is the seduction, I think maybe we should look to academia more and offer more criticism there. I have just graduated at Goldsmiths, and I think there is definitely a pattern in terms of you coming in, first-generation immigrant coming into Britain, 
acknowledging my privilege in the world and being very lucky to be in that position. But then you go through the system, if you're unfortunate enough to take any kind of gender studies, they have you leave it and thinking you're oppressed and you know, you're know owed something. It's, it's, it's very difficult. So I think there's the, the seduction lies in there where your, your thoughts, how to use this language, how to, how to use your race, gender, sexuality as political currency, because identity politics, the way I, I see it, is a contest for power. And they teach you to use that to be able to you know, stamp your feet and, and make demands. Okay. Be good to hear from someone who thinks identity is quite important to them. Ella, I think you mentioned that we have forgotten that it's not about where we came from, but where we were going. Um, and of course, I can't remember back that far, but uh, to me, it seems that maybe 50, 100 years ago, actually the boxes were much more defined that um, if you were working class, you ate a certain way, you spoke a certain way, you lived in a certain place, uh, and the same if you're middle class or upper class. And um, I don't see how politics ever hasn't been founded in identity. Um, I may be wrong here, but I think if you were working class, you would vote Labour. If you were middle class, upper class, you would vote Conservative. So uh, do you not think it's possible that actually we're just at an intermediate step on the right path, that uh, we have more versatility in the boxes we tick, even though there are still boxes, um, and actually we're, there's not much we need to change, it's just going to take time. What I was going to bring up is LGBT specifically, and the, one of the reasons why I say I'd rather dramatically stopped identifying as like part of LGBT because the politics are so reactionary. And I think that the problem is big corporations milking LGBT f to get money off people. And it ends up with LGBT forgetting what actually gave them rights. You know, the Stonewall riot was a riot. It wasn't people sitting down and going, oh, please, can we have some rights? Yeah, sure, here's your rights. It was so much more complicated and more dramatic and it's just sort of sad that it's been forgotten and been replaced by this very submissive, very counter-revolutionary thing that just puts us in a position where we can't do anything. Okay, great, thank you. I'm going to bring Ella back in. And be good to have a think about this, because so, most people have come down siding with the panel who are quite critical, mm -hmm. and uh, quite a lot of people put their hands up and said, identity politics is important to them. I would like to, to, to hear why it's important. Yeah, but, just... Uh, Ella. Two points. Um, I, the thing is, when these, because we come do a lot of debates with Spiked and we um, try and engage people who have this opposite opinion, um, and it's not, it's not a kind of, I don't think it's just a crass, very shallow opinion that these people who are very indebted to identity politics hold, who do believe that the fact that they are, um, you know, a black gay woman is intrinsic to what they believe in and me as a white straight woman can't identify with them, it's because um, it hasn't just dropped out of the sky. It is a long process of the kind of liberatory movements of the past, the gay liberation movement, you know, feminism, certainly second wave femi and third wave feminism, um, continued to, uh, once they'd kind of got a certain amount of freedom, then sunk into defining those liberatory movements on the basis of their identity rather than on universal collective arguments for freedom. So that we're kind of experiencing now the young generation of what has been a long time coming. And so actually it's not just the fact that these young people are, you know, kind of crass students as they're often characterised as just kind of sounding off. There's actually something a lot deeper going on there. But the question here is very interesting and there's a, there's a great example to um, look at it because I think it's about aspiration actually because in the past, that's why I was trying to say about the you can be anything. In the past people were much more constrained, you know, actually physically and you know, materially constrained far more than they are today. Um, but the, the idea of aspiration has been kind of done down and has been bastardised. So you've got in, um, I think it's either Oxford or Cambridge now, quotas to try and get working class people in to universities. There's discussions about lowering the, um, the exam mark, lowering the marks for A's for working class people. So what that's basically saying is, uh, but on the basis of where, who your parents were and where you were born, you can't really, you can't do anything you want. So we, we acknowledge that and we're closing that down for you. So I think in, in the key thing that really irks me about this focus on identity politics is not that people are really obsessed with, uh, you know, the fact that what they look like, I think, you know, 
That's fine, that's a relatively shallow point, but it's the fact that that, that that would limit you, that being a black person would somehow limit you because you're not, you know, you don't have white privilege, or yeah. being a working class person would limit you because you don't, you know, it's a very kind of, it's a low view of people, I think. Yeah, I'm just nodding violent agreement, and it's um, like you responding to the, the, the young chap there. It's, it's, there's, you know, the freedom to be who you wish to be is a great modern fact, and um, to dislike that modern identity politics is not to say let's go back to the 1950s. But there's a sort of pathologization of self which has infected every political discussion. So take that access issue, or it applies to almost every issue. Within seconds of starting to talk about how do we widen access, it ends up talking about, well, there must be some, in, by intent, racial prejudice or some other prejudice against other forms of identity. It can't just be something more complicated and multifactorial that will take decades to solve. It must be something to do with the identity, either of the people who are doing the selection or the people who are doing the application. And in my head, I think of that as pseudo pathologization. If that's not a word, I claim it as my, as my <laughs> word. That's what I dislike about identity politics. Absolutely not that we all get to say, stuff you, you're not telling me how I live my life or how I dress or whatever. Okay. I'd like to try to offer an opposing view. And I'm surprised that the whole panel is sharing the same view. I'm not into conspiracy theories, but maybe there's some truth. In that. <laughs> Tell but, us what uh, you think then, sir. Well, I'm, I'm surprised that a Tory might be asking for us to restart the class struggle, which is interesting in itself. Uh, but, I mean, the naivety of the arguments that have been presented is that somehow identity is simply a choice. In a meritocratic society, maybe that could be the case. But what C. Wright Mill says is the whole point of politics is to see personal troubles and public concerns, and that's where the personal and political comes in. And the, the origins of identity politics are really focused around new social movements uh, that emerged in the post post-empire period, uh, and, and obviously feminism was the first identity politics, and then, you know, I read, I read a book called The Empire Strikes Back, back in the 80s, and that made it clear that this was about people who were subject to all kinds of oppressions, uh, claiming an identity in order to collectivise and to fight and to struggle, and that's what politics is about. Yes, maybe uh, those, uh, uh, those, those struggles themselves need to morph into other kinds of struggles, maybe that's the argument. It's not that that those struggles are illegitimate or wrong, that we all should become individuals. That's a very nasty kind of neoliberal project that we would fall into. But to, the, to, to create new identity politics, new forms of organising, and I think that's the important okay. point that we should be focusing okay. on. Okay, good points. I think that sometimes our idea of fitting identity is related to the idea, our need to belong, that sometimes is driven by fear, so we need a protection inside an identity. Also, this idea of fitting in boxes is related to the need of, to control somehow. So the, sometimes who is in power or authority needs to control and fit us in boxes. And so we need a bit more flexibility that is against this rigidity that wants to fit in boxes. And flexibility is somehow related to more feminine aspect of our human being more than a male aspect that is very predominant and rigid. And also I think that this uh, debate about identity right now is also created by, well, internet and social media. So we enter in contact with people who technically doesn't have anything, don't have anything in common with us, and then we discover that, wow, they have a lot in common with us. Why? Why do I have something in common with someone who is completely different from me? So this brings to who am I? Why have these things in common? I have my own answer, but I just want to throw this out. I'd be very interested in some of the younger people here as well speaking, because I lecture first years, and when I um, raise the question that perhaps diversity and difference and celebrating this isn't a particularly good thing, I think quite a few of them look at me like I'm a monster of some description, because throughout their school life, I think this is the discussion. And the reason I find it difficult, I think, to engage is because I don't think they think about this politically. So a lot of you are discussing this politically. They think about it as a kind of form of etiquette, that they're being polite. And to be a nice person is to respect difference. And I must admit, I loved Graham's point at the end where he said um, this thing about uh, things that are different to me are getting further away Right? And I think that somehow we've got to be able to crack this idea and put across these ideas without necessarily discussing politics in the way that we might think about it. Because actually I think one of the problems with 
the issue of difference is that you might think you're being polite and that it's an etiquette and that makes you closer to somebody, but actually you're becoming further apart from these people rather than f being connected. But that's not how it's experienced, I don't think. Yeah, I was going to say, I think the whole, a lot of the identity, the box and things like that may have come from like pollsters and things like that because they just naturally seek a way to have people in a, in a format that makes them easy to manipulate on a spreadsheet. Um, but what I wanted to say was, um, the, um, which if you wanted to comment on the way that this identity politics has an effect on politics and um, in particular, because you often hear like, um, uh, particularly with George Osborne and David Cameron, these people um, went to Eton and then um, went to Cambridge and Oxford. Um, what do they know about um, you know, making laws for the vast majority of people who didn't go to Eton and Oxford. That's often used as a common thing. And especially when there are reports, um, inquiries, they appoint a judge and people get very upset and say, this judge knows nothing about the people who were the victims of whatever. How is he going to be able to, um, you know, adjudicate on this on this matter? Um, so I just want to, if people want to comment on whether nobody can adjudicate or... Um, you know, do anything unless they have lived the experience of all people. That. Hello, I'm one of the older people, um, and I, I was in London at a time when Norman Tebbit said to working class people, if you get on your bike, you can um, achieve something. So I got on my bike and uh, tried to achieve something, and that's <coughs> when I came into conflict with society through my identity, be, being a working class um a working class person, I found that certain doors weren't open to me. So it was, it was through trying to do things that, um, in a way, I was very much more aware of the, my identity than actually um, just sitting back and um, being aware of my identity beforehand. Um, and it just made me wonder uh, what, what barriers to younger people come across now. Uh, for me, I was trying to achieve something and my identity became something that I needed to think about. And some people answered it by using quotas and that kind of thing. Um, what is it younger people are trying to achieve? My point's actually quite linked to what Joe just said. Okay. I work in education and I feel very conflicted and I would be interested in what the panel has to say. Um, we have to um, pay a great deal of attention to pupil premium uh, children who are disadvantaged and vulnerable. Um, and I'm in a position to decide how to spend that money um, and identify those children. But I feel very uncomfortable about that because um, back in the day, I would have been one of those disadvantaged children. And I don't think I would have wanted somebody like me identifying me and talking about me in rooms and, and, and keeping trainers under desks for me. Um, I would have felt really patronized by that. So I would be interested in your views on okay. that. The reason that I think identity is important and needs to be spoken about is because there is structural disadvantages related to certain aspects of the identity. If it be, for example, that rates of homelessness are so high in the trans community, or why is there such a difference in suicide rates between young men and then older women, for example, if we just ignore that these that these identities are having an effect on the place that we have in society, then there's no way that, like was said in the panel, that we can trans, um, transcend these differences. It's only when we have open and honest conversations regarding identity that we can overcome um, any certain barrier. And also, I take issue with the argument that young people are talking about identity out of an etiquette reason and not because they're political. I think young people now are becoming so politicised because they're looking at identities and they're seeing about and how the disadvantage is apparent and they're using that and they're um, catalyzing that for a political force. So I think identity is important to discuss and then also how we're using that to translate into a political um, prism. This is closely related to the point that was just made, but identifying as a woman may not be particularly important to me, but I definitely think that it's important to feminism. If we can't say that feminism is about acknowledging and correcting for the oppression that women have suffered at the hands of men, then what can we say? And Ella, for you to say that that means feminists are obsessed with victimhood is just ridiculous. As for your dismissal of the phrase, the personal is political, you are sitting here at a political debate criticizing women for sharing their experiences of sexual assault on social media. The sexual lives of women have always been politicized and it's only now that they're taking it into their own hands that people have a problem with it. Okay, I'm gonna bring the panel back in. Ella, 
that was at you, so do you want to answer that? Yeah, then, yeah. <laughs> no, it's a good point, because um, just first of all, on the lived experience one, because this is really interesting, and it was uncomfortably brought to light with the realisation that The Guardian, um, I think it's the majority of Guardian writers, which is, you know, a left-wing, largely left-wing um, newspaper, are educated in private schools. Uh, now, that I wouldn't care about that, but the fact that a lot of the content of those writers is about patronising um, working-class people, from my point of view, and patronising people who went to state schools... So then that's important, that, you know, that's not just for the fact that they went to Eton, but it's the, what they say in relation to their identity that is important. Um, the thing about, uh, the, the reason why I am criticising feminism specifically, obviously it's something that, I, it's an area that I'm particularly interested in, but it's because, um, you know, Sylvia Pankhurst, who was not a feminist, feminism wasn't a word back then, um, who, but who was someone who was fighting for women's liberation, uh, was not just interested in the oppression of women, which was real then. She wasn't just interested in what it, you know, women's experience. She wanted to, um, you know, she was interested in working class struggle. She was interested in much more universalist arguments about liberation. And um, the kind of where feminism gets it right and where it got it right in the past, I think, is where it was talking about not liberating women, but liberating individuals, seeing women as individuals who should be as equal to men, whose gender shouldn't matter anymore. That's why I say an end to feminism in the book, because it shouldn't be a thing about a women's liberationary movement. That's with the caveat that sometimes it is important. So, for example, with the abortion debate, there's a discussion now where the government, I think, is going to go in line with the UN and call people pregnant, call pregnant women pregnant people. Now, in the context of an argument where, in the context of a situation where women are still denied access to abortion and their bodily autonomy is still restricted by the government, it is important to talk about women in terms of that. And it is important to say pregnant women, not pregnant people. So it has its nuances. But on the whole, I think it's much more progressive and much more exciting to talk about liberation in terms of, you know, individuals, human beings, rather than narrowing it down to the specific identity of that group. Great. Christine, have you got anything? Brief, brief comments before we go back out. Uh, yeah, let's see the difference between identity today and uh, a political fight tomorrow, yesterday. For example, social inequalities, there is social inequalities today. There is no discussion that sometimes you find more uh, and less black people that you will expect to have. But the discussion today is that somehow, because of racism, especially in the past, any things that we found in society will be explained by racism. So basically, the conclusion is already being given by the assumptions. So you, instead of trying to understand what is going on, what are the social barriers that some people, some groups are facing, we are already assuming that it's social discrimination and that somehow, um, you know, this is basically, for me, it's basically, you don't even try to change your society. All you're doing is that my personal experience is this, and this is it, and this is, you know, let's fight for grievances. Identity is about grievances. Blackness. I mean, I've never heard of this black pride and blackness, black power, so much today. I mean, from the past, it wasn't that much. I mean, I, I'm not an American, so the American is a bit of different. But today it's about blackness and black hair and black skin and I'm a powerful woman. This doesn't change anything to society. All he's saying is being proud of yourself, being proud of you. Uh, uh, it's, it, you. Instead of going outward and trying to understand what we are facing, we are selling we have to kind of celebrate our own identity. We are becoming different groups of people. And because if you're black, you're being oppressed in the past, so then you are saying, I was oppressed in the past, so could you please give me some, you know, it's about grievances. For me, it's the expectation. What do we want in society? Identity is not about expectation. It's about the world is this way, and we keep it this, you know, we keep it... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Give it a rest. Uh, I'm just no, no, but uh, 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 the, no, there was also, sorry. Uh, uh, the oppressed things, actually, the, the woman was saying that this is a very good example. If you, if you listen to all the discussions amongst black, um, because I'm following that for my research, all, all discussions around black, it's the um, oppression, slavery, especially in America, all that is being used as a way of fighting for a particular interest for a particular group. It's not saying we want to have equality, we want to have a, a, a life like everybody else. It's about how, as a particular groups, or at least as a particular uh, uh, individuals, we want to get something out of society. So for me, so again, 
you have an imagination that somehow the society that we have is the only way that we can organize ourselves, and you're going to basically kind of take a little bit of a pie. You know, I want a bit more than the white person now because they had the white more than the black person before. So it should, it's, it's, for me, it's very restricting imagination. And, and I found it so sad that the young people, you know, I was a young, I was an idealist, I want to change the world. And all we're asking them is, okay, this is the way it is, fight for little corner. Okay, need to get. Last couple of questions in. Um. Hi, um, I agree with what you're saying because I think the more that we celebrate diversity, the more divided society is becoming because the more focusing on our differences and not on the mutual desire to improve society as a whole. I would just like to propose an, uh, a solution to what Graham said about the straight people uh, protesting against gay Tories marching, that it is the most inward thing you can possibly do. Maybe they might do it, so when they go home and open a can of beer, they feel very warm and fuzzy inside that they did something good for the world. So all this maybe is just a kind of, uh, you said the pseudo pathologization. I can't pronounce that word, but it's a gr great concept. Thank you. But, uh, <laughs> but maybe they uh, feel like the entire world is a couch in a therapist's office, and what is inward has to go outward, and there is no separation between the outside world and their interior ego. So I would propose this as a solution to why people who are straight do that. Probably a bit late to ask this question. I watched this video online just recently and um, these American students were berating one of their um, lecturers for something he'd said. And something that really struck me, one of the students, she kept screaming, you are what you say, you are what you say, you are what you say. And I thought it was really interesting insight, perhaps into the psychology of identity politics, because if I am what I say, and you disagree with me, you're not just agreeing, disagreeing with what I say, you're disagreeing with who I am, with my being. If you attack my opinion, if you attack my ideas, what I say, you're not just attacking my opinion, you're attacking my core being. Yeah. So I'd just like to ask the panel, do you agree you are what you say? I think that identity, personal identity, is important. I think it's, it would be you know, denying our humanity to say that we don't care about where we're from or that we don't, it's not interesting to us about our, our gender or who we sleep with or what country we're from or who our parents are. That's something intrinsically you know, th to be celebrated and to be enjoyed about our personalities. That's, a, that's something that I think is very positive. But when it comes to your engagement in political life, and what I mean by that is your desire to change the world, hopefully, your desire to you know, interact with other human beings in a political landscape, um, that becomes, I think, sometimes in the current state, a barrier to what I would like to see as a universalist outlook. And I don't mean some kind of shiny, happy utopia, but a situation in which we fight for people's freedom on the basis that we think all people should be equal and free, not, you know, not some people rather than others or not other people for different reasons to others. So I think, you know, I, and I think this idea is starting to catch on because the more and more identity politics goes down this very, very black and kind of dystopian hole of being obsessed with our personalities, people are starting to wake up to the fact that this isn't a progressive movement, that this is actually a reactionary way of putting people back into boxes. Thanks. Thanks very much. Hey, to sum up, um, um, I would say this. I was honestly terrified at the start. And probably you can tell from my body language, I'm no longer frightened. I thought that was an absolutely fantastic discussion. And even those of you who didn't agree with me or who made comments with which I didn't resonate, I thought that it's now possible, I realise, to conduct a discussion like this with civility and respect for one another. And that, if nothing else, gives me hope for the future. The young chap I was going to big up the most, I loved him. Um, what you said, and, and the young, and, but the, the young chap there who made the Brit Grenfell comment, he's left, so I can't pick him up. But he, he made the point of proof the impossibility of, of identity politics, which is where I came in. If we refuse to accept that people who are not like us can sit in judgment of us, then we're saying that nobody can have an opinion about anyone else because we do contain vast multitudes. Not one of us is like any other one of us. Right. I think for me, one of the things that we always forget, or at least one of the things that I believe, but other people don't seem to kind of agree with me all the time, but I see each of us as individual, rational, active um, people. We can make decisions. So I can go into politics as a black person, but by discussing ideas and discuss with other people, I can decide, uh, I can be involved in basically changing my identity. 
you know, you have to give an attitude, attribute, give an attribute that been, you're born with, but by actively involving the world, you're changing yourself and you're changing the world. And today, what people has, have been asked with identity politics or identity is to basically to only change yourself. You don't really, you know, you stay looking at yourself inward. You're not changing and become actually what Ella is saying, which for me is really that, is you're not thinking about what you're going to become and how you're going to be actively involved in the world and changing it. It's all, it's too, it's too, too, too inward. Okay. And I don't want to... Great. Can we thank our speakers and thank you to the audience. Enjoy the rest of your day.